Good morning. Welcome to Hope in Christ Church. I am the third string opener. So we had two different cancellations. The Valente family is still ill and couldn't be with us. And then uh, Katie was going to fill in for that. But she had a surprise birthday present from Ross. And uh, uh, the email said that he wished her away. But I don't think that's what she meant. <laughs> I, 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 think, I, think he, I think she meant whisked her away. Um, so we'll go with that one. But God bless both those families. And uh, we just, uh, you know, we know that uh, they're with us uh, in spirit and that they're usually here. But um, it's just a blessing to have both those families and all these families. And speaking of families, boy, uh, Paul's letter, uh, inspired by God to the Colossian church last week, showed us how we gather as a family. And boy, we gathered yesterday, didn't we? What a great bunch of uh, family members you were yesterday helping us get this large campus, I guess you could call it. It's 12 acres or so and two buildings and all kinds of stuff going on here. Got it all whipped into shape for, uh, for another year of, of action. So I do have a bunch of uh, announcements here. You, not all of them I'll, I'll go over, but uh, they're listed in your bulletin. But I do want to mention that there is an updated Help Wanted 
um, list in the foyer for you to take a look at. There's some changes there. I also wanted to mention to you that next week uh, there is going to be a ministry leader meeting. And um, I'll be sending emails out to remind ministry leaders of that. But I also want to invite all of you that want to uh, come and witness and give some great ideas and listen to us um, kind of evaluate where we are and work on our schedule and try to see how ministries are going to work together and help each other and just kind of plan out the next few months of our life here as a church. So uh, that will be next week, and I'll be sending an email out for you on that. Um, what else do we have here? Um, discipleship class is coming up first week of June, and I think that we have it pretty well settled that it's going to be on Friday nights, and um, it is probably going to be again in Northwood like our last Friday night class was. But if that's something that you're interested in, um, what is the Bible? What is God like? What is a Trinity, creation, prayer, angels, demons, man, sin? Who is Christ? What is atonement and resurrection? What does it mean to be a Christian? Justification, adoption, sanctification. Perseverance, what happens when you die? Return to Christ. What's heaven going to be like? That's the kind of stuff we're going to go at, one or two topics uh, every week through the summertime. So if you want to learn about that stuff or you just want to be in an atmosphere where people talk about that stuff, sign up. There's a sign-up sheet in the foyer. Uh, Jeff and Carol's class is canceled. They texted me this morning from somewhere in Wyoming. So they won't be having a class on Wednesday. And this week also we'll have no... Um, Friday night foundations class. So Wednesday during the day and Friday night is canceled. Uh, baptisms or and or baby dedications. Let me know if you're interested in either of those things because we celebrate them as a congregational church, as a church family. And we want to uh, take part in the, uh, the growth and the, and the, uh, the spiritual growth and physical growth of your child at, um, at your request. And we also want to you know, celebrate your new birth in Christ. So let us know with that. And... Uh, Let's start off with a word of prayer. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, just thank you for gathering us here today. Thank you for this body of believers. Thank you for your presence and your care and your spirit. Thank you for people that are visiting. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you've given us. Lord, I pray today that you'd give us ear to hear what you have to say, that you'd give us eyes to see how it applies to our lives, that you would give us a heart to love you and to love each other, that you would give our body a desire to serve you and to love each other and to serve each other in your name, Lord. You know, strip us of our pride and our own desires so that we can worship you here in spirit and truth. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Will you stand as we continue to worship together? Psalm 72 says, Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone works wonders, and blessed be his glorious name forever. There is salvation in no one else, but there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved.
Lord, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name.
hearts you know, to worship you for the rest of this day, Lord. May you glory and honor to serve you holy, only Lord God, because you are holy. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This is the time uh, each month where we uh, celebrate, observe the Lord's Supper. And um, as we do it here today, um, it's going to be a little bit different than we've been doing for the past couple of years for two different reasons. And both stem uh, from my personal time in the book of Leviticus over the past month or so. Uh, the first thing is that... Um, you know, the book of Leviticus really teaches the importance of worshiping God as he desires, right? <clears throat> Looking right at the core of the issue, he is God. He is all-powerful. He's all-knowing and ever-present. Always good. Ruling over all things. And we are his creation. You know, able to do nothing that even comes close to those attributes that he possesses. But here we are. You know, in, in obedience to him, coming together in thankful adoration for what his son has provided us. You know, the righteousness, you know, the adoption, you know, the ability to, to, to be sanctified and be holy. So how do we do that as a sinful creation? How do we do it in a way that's profound and honoring? I, I think that um, maybe what we've missed a little bit with the, uh, with the cups that we take with us is, is a time of, of reflection and prayer and repentance. Um, and I think that as the, um, as the deacons uh, serve it like we used to, even though we're using the one-time cups that we're bound to determine to use, um, that it'll give us that time um, to seek God and to seek forgiveness and to seek repentance and just be alone with him for a moment during this time. Uh, so we're gonna do that. Um, secondly, though, I also want to make a connection to what we're doing here today with what I was studying on Thursday, if you follow us in our devotional here in Leviticus 13. Um, and, and on Thursday, um, we were looking at the Day of Atonement. You know, I always looked at Yom Kippur as, a, as a, another day off from school when I was young. But there's much, much more to it. It was the holiest of Jewish festival days when the high priest was to perform elaborate rituals to atone for the people's sins. That began when the, the high priest of Israel went into the Holy of Holies for the only time during the year. And the people were to understand the atonement for sin was being done God's way. Not a way they could make up. You know, the priest would, would go into the tabernacle uh, ceremonially cleansed, dressed in a different way than he did every other year. Two goats were brought in. One was sacrificed because of the uncleanliness and rebellion of the Israelites. You know, whatever sins they had done, were, this goat was being sacrificed for. The other goat was used as a scapegoat. That's where we get that term. Right? Aaron, with a high priest at the time in Leviticus, was, he placed his hand on the head of the goat. He confessed over it all the rebellion and wickedness of the Israelites. And then he sent this goat out with an appointed man who released it into the wilderness. Right? The goat was symbolic of carrying the people's sins out of the temple, out of the city, into the wilderness, far from them. So, so while to think about this as a Christian observance it would probably be more like our Easter celebration but really that's what we're celebrating here today and, and just a, a remembrance of how Christ atoned for our sins so what we're doing is remembering that commemorating that event the sufficiency and completeness of the sacrifice of Christ it was seen in those goats right the sacrifice of one ritually appeasing the wrath of God and the second one that removed the sins Right? Sin is both forgiven and removed God's way by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. The wrath of God is satisfied. 
The mercy of God is exercised as sin is forgiven and removed. That's what we celebrate here today. And I hope that the time that we have as the deacons pass out the elements will give us time to reflect on the death of the Son of God that our sins necessitated. So I'd like the deacons to come forward at this time. And that time of reflection, that time of prayer, that time of repentance is made real by the words of Jesus. And if you can, if you can picture the moment when he sat among his disciples, knowing full well what he was going to endure, but also what that would bring about, the, the gravity of that situation it, it is just... I, I can't get my head around it, but uh, the pure and perfect Holy Son of God coming to live on this earth, living with all the same baloney that we put him through was going on then, but then to die in our place. He asked us to do this in remembrance of him. And he took the bread and he blessed it. Dear Lord Father, thank you. Thank you for the sacrifice that made us pure in your sight. In the remembrance of him. And as he drank the cup, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. New covenant in my blood. And as often as you drink it, remember me. Dear Lord, thank you for the blood that was spilled that washed me clean. And they drank. Let's pray.
Dear Lord, we attempt to do this in remembrance of your son Jesus Christ every month. And every month it just seems so insufficient. But we keep trying, Lord. And I pray that you'd see that in our heart. That you would keep the atoning death of Christ in the forefront of our lives as the motivation, as the atmosphere, as the reason that we're here, Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, at this time, the children are excused for Children's Church. And uh, as the parents uh, bring them back to get signed in, uh, why don't you jump up, stretch your legs, find somebody that you don't know or haven't seen in a while, and uh, say hi, introduce yourself. Try not to get tangled up in our microphone cord. Would be a win. Okay, I think we got our little darlings uh, in their assigned rooms so we can get going by uh, digging into the Word of God. If you have your uh, Bibles and your outlines and your pens, uh, join me in opening your good book up to the Paul's letter to the Colossians. And we're in chapter 1, verse 9, and we're going to go up to verse 14. In this section of Scripture here, we're going to see something really fascinating, I believe. Um, Christians are and always have been obsessed somewhat 
with understanding what God has in store for us in the future, right? What's his plan for us? What does he want us to do with our lives? What we're going to see here today is a process that he wants us to undertake to be able to access as much of that plan as God decides to reveal to us. What can we do that will invite God to give us direction and goals and targets to shoot for as far as understanding where he wants us? But we also like to take shortcuts, don't we? And we'll usually try four or five of those shortcuts before we smarten up and follow God's procedure for finding and understanding where he actually wants us. I tried to explain this to a Christian couple not long ago in my office where they were determined to find God's will for their life in their own way without God's help. And they ended up flying all the way to India, took a train way up north in the mountains that separated that, uh, India from Tibet, hired a guide, climbed up this extremely steep mountain. For days and days they traveled, even the guide gave up. And they finally reached the summit. There sat a weathered old prophet with casts on both of his legs. It was there as they approached him, they began to notice this terrible stench. But they ignored it and they approached him and they pleaded with him, please tell us what God's will is for our life. We've traveled so far, we've endured such hardships. Just to ask you this question, what does God want us to do? And as he opened his mouth to answer, they realized that the foul odor was his breath. It was horrible. And they covered their, their noses as he spoke and he said to them, just like my hands are rough and hard from my many years living off the land and how my legs are weak that they've just broken just by walking and supporting my weight, so shall your lives be rough and hard and weak and broken. Now get off my mountain. They were really disappointed. And they walked back down the mountain and they took the train and the plane and back. And the next week they were in my office again. I said, I wish we hadn't even gone. The guy was just an angry old fraud. And I said, what did you expect from a super calloused, fragile mystic vexed with halitosis? <laughs> Do I have to go away again? <laughs> you, know, you didn't think I'd outdo the hairline one, right? But, I mean, we're just talking about the, the amazing lengths we'll go to to try to understand God's will for our life other than the way he wants us to. We can go to all these extraordinary lengths to see the future, discover what the best course of action is, but many times we ignore what God desires to reveal to us. We don't know to go, we need to go to India to discover it. The scripture we're looking at here today is going to give us some insight on how God reveals his will for our lives. And that's the one thing that I pray you take home from this service, is as members of God's family, we must seek to discover and fulfill his will for our lives. And if you were here with us last week, you know um, that God calls us to live as a family, brothers and sisters, bound by faith, bound for our love for each other and our love for him. And if you didn't um, get that last week, you can go back and listen to it. Four hours of it. The letter continues from last week. Last week we talked about all the things that he got the report about the church in Colossae and he was so thankful for all the stuff he saw there. He was worried about them because there was some bad stuff circling ready to come in but he saw some great stuff there. He was thankful to God for what was already there. This letter as it continues is the prayer he has for it for the future. Right? It has to do with what he calls God's will. So before we jump into the scripture, let's, let's try to get our arms around what is God's will? What, is, what does this concept mean? And there's a lot of ways to look at God's will, but I understand it best to be able to give to you as being split up into two parts, two distinct categories, right? Like you can take a, a, a parking lot full of cars and you can divide it up in a bunch of different ways, you know, uh, light colored, dark colored, all wheel drive you know, four-wheel drive or American or import or, but this way to, to divide up this concept of God's will, I think it's most helpful to look at it as 
what we call his secret will, or his sovereign will, and his revealed will. His secret will is what he determines to happen. Right? God's secret will is that you were born and that you're here worshiping today. There's no way around it. Okay? He either decreed it or he allowed it to happen. It's under his control. But we also have God's will as a description of what he reveals to us as what he desires to happen. It's also God's, called God, God's will, and he reveals it to us so we know it as God's revealed will. Example, um, Micah 6 8. Right? What does God want from you? What is good? Well, he wants you to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Is this what God wants for all Christians to do? Absolutely. Is this what we always do? No. It's an example of his revealed will. So you have secret, sovereign will, and we have his revealed will. So let's take a look at our scripture here and see how these two concepts fit. Which, one, which one's going to fit into this verse, these verses? I think we'll go to um, verse 9. <clears throat> And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance, and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. <clears throat> so which one of these definitions, secret or revealed, fits in to that verse? Are we talking about the secret will or revealed will? Well, as I'm fond of doing, let's just reject the question. Why can't it be both? I found the most helpful verse in the Bible to help me understand God's will is Deuteronomy 29, 29. God's speaking through Moses. And he says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that, that we may do all the words of this law. There's the two wills of God working together. Right? The secret will that belongs to God alone, and then the revealed will that is given to us so we can obey him and take part in his secret will. Right, so what is it about this secret will that God has that's so appealing? Right, why do we want a piece of that? Well, it's our Father's work, number one. And as a child, we always want to take part in His work. Secondly, it's always good. Right, we know that for all those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purposes. That's Romans 8.28. God's secret will is where he wants us. It's what he wants us doing. It's how we do it. The answer to all the questions that we have, that we lay awake at night wondering what we should be doing. That's where we want to get, that secret will, where God wants us. Deuteronomy 29, 29 is showing us the relationship between that secret will and the revealed will. To find the secret will... That's where he wants you. What he wants you to be doing, you must seek and pursue his revealed will. But you need to discover what he's revealed to you already and obey it. And that will direct you towards his perfect will. So where does God reveal his will? In Scripture. Right? That's where, the, when we see in the, in the verse there, it talks about the knowledge, the wisdom, and the understanding, right? That's where God reveals his revealed will primarily. It's in Scripture. And if you look at the verses in the New Testament where God reveals, uh, his revealed will is disclosed, there's lots of places. You can find a clear path to get you going on this, right? Let me give you an example. You have a very important decision to make in your life. It's going to alter the course of your life. 
You want God's secret will. Where does he really want me? You go to the Bible, you flip through all the pages, you don't see anything that directly correlates to your specific situation. So you start with the basics. What's the basics of God's revealed will? Wait, 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 4. God desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. Right? Or 2 Peter 3, 9, same thing. God is not wishing that any should perish, but all should reach repentance. Right? If you don't know God through faith in Christ, there's no way to discover his plan for your life. Right? So that's about as basic as you can get. Secondly, you could go to a place like 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. For God has not called us to impurity, but to live in holiness. Right? Sanctification is growing more Christ-like, spiritual maturity. The process of living more and more and more of a holy life as God desires. It's removing the ungodliness from our lives and offering them our lives in worship and service. And it's what we watch on TV. It's, it's what we say about someone when they're not with us. It's what websites we visit. It's the pursuit of holiness in all that we do. That's sanctification. Right? You can also look for revealed will, God's revealed will in your life in, in verses like 1 Thessalonians 5.16 and, and, and a few verses past that too. Rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in everything for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. That's where we have to start if you really want to find out the object that he desires you to get to. But it's not all puppy dogs and rainbows, right? God's will for us to suffer, 1 Peter 4.19. Or 1 Peter 2.15. We need to be ready and willing to do good as to silence the ignorance and the fools around us. Right? This is the path we must travel to find what you seek. You know, so if you're asking questions to God, like, what job should I take? What house should I buy? What church should I settle into? What school should I go into? Is this the right person for me to spend the rest of my life with? <clears throat> to discover these answers, you need to go to God's revealed will. Even when it doesn't seem remotely connected. God's revealed will directs you to his secret will. There's no shortcuts that I'm aware of. You know, I shared this verse with you last week, but I'll share it again. I wouldn't be surprised if I did it pretty frequently. But, um, you know, all scripture is breathed out by God, profitable for teaching and reproof and correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Good work, remember? God's calling something a good work. That's him saying that. That must be his secret will. That must be where he wants you to end up. So by obeying his revealed will leads you to that place he wants you at. By being taught and reproved and corrected and trained and equipped by God's revealed will, which is in scripture. It may seem like a roundabout way to get there. Right? I know we all want... Complete, direct answers now. And if God chooses to, he can. But this is tried and true. Go to scripture. Not to the place where it says your name and yes, you should work for the Acme Anvil Company. But to go to scripture and see exactly what God desires you to do that he's revealing and that you're not doing And then as you change your ways, as you come to faith, as you sanctify yourself, he'll reveal as little or as much of that secret will as he desires to. Try it. But you need to be honest with yourself. You need to be honest with God about what you need help obeying. The right? process can be difficult. It can hurt a little bit, but it's not just for your own comfort. Right? There's a lot of benefits. They're going to ripple outwards from you through space and time for generations when you go through this process. Because, that's our second point. Oh, that was our first point. It's possible. Sorry. 
The second point is it has a purpose. The purpose is bigger than us. Right? When we press on, when we seek, seek God's will through that salvation and sanctification and suffering, God gives us a glimpse of where he wants us, that job, that home, that church, that person. When you're in the place that God wants you, doing what God wants you to, these last five verses give a picture of what you're going to experience there. And God calls it walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. Right? Walking in a manner, living in a way worthy of the Lord, pleasing to Christ. Showing that we value him and all he's done for us. The Son of God gave his life so that we could be free from sin. So we could be free from the penalty for that sin. He gave us a new life with the Spirit of God in us to guide us and help, for, help us and comfort us. He's gone forward to prepare a place for us with God. He sits there at God's right hand intervening for us at this moment. We need to live in a way that shows we value that. We value him for who he is and what he's done, what he's doing now. So for us to wallow in that sin afterwards is not living in a worthy manner. But walking in this way is, is bearing fruit in every good work is what it says. Bearing fruit, it's the spiritual disposition we have, right? It's the spiritual reason for our good works, right? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand, so we should walk in them, Ephesians 2.10. So, you know, is, is our faith governing our actions? Is it controlling our patience and our generosity and our love for others? We talked about this on Friday night. A continual disposition of love towards all people that is so instinctive that you act in a way that's helpful and loving and encouraging and Christ-like without even thinking about it. I'm saying that we talked about it on Friday night and, and I'm, uh, I think we came up with more questions than answers, to tell you the truth. Because it's, uh, it's something we struggle with. People are tough to love sometimes. The only way I can even come close to having this disposition is to see myself in that other person and how God treated me. I'm just a wretched sinner saved by grace. No more than that. I need to see my old self in that person that I run into that doesn't know Christ. That's how I can love him. Maybe it's also someone, maybe, maybe it's someone that knows Christ, but needs a hand. Right? I need, to, I need to see myself in that person too, because I've needed a hand before. We're also going to be increasing in the knowledge of God. That's in verse 10 also. Continue to know more and more about him intellectually so we can grow closer and closer to him uh, relationally. Right? They go hand in hand. Right? You can know all sorts of stuff about God and not trust in him, not depend on him. It's just knowledge. But we can also focus on knowing him relationally without knowing more about him as he's revealed himself in Scripture. And that, when we do that, we run the real risk of assembling a false God in our own image. Right? One that's not going to challenge our false beliefs. One that won't convict us of our sins. One that just wants to give us a comfortable life without any disturbance. Right? This whole religions that practice this thing on a, on a Sunday. Right? He told us that a time was coming when people would not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they'd accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And they're going to turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. God is going to be pulling us closer and closer and closer, deeper and deeper and deeper into the knowledge of him so that we can go deeper and deeper and deeper into him relationally, trusting more, depending more, praying more. I was reading uh, something by a, uh, 
an English Puritan uh, in the 1600s, Thomas Manton, the other day, and he was talking about the church as a river. And he said, if it gets wider and wider instead of deeper and deeper, just like a river, it loses its power. And it is, they, they were dealing with the same stuff in the 1600s in England. But God also is going to strengthen us, right? In verse 11, walking in a manner worthy of the Lord will strengthen us in his power for endurance and patience and joy. Not being strengthened so we can be a big shot. Not so we can demand our own desires from him. Strengthened so that we can be equipped for what God has in store for us, right? That perfect spot where we can be effective and do these good works for him. Strengthened so that we can endure hardships and insult and loneliness and poverty and injury that might come along with his secret will for our lives. God's secret will for you and me might not be postcard material. We don't really know. He may have a difficult place, difficult ministry for us, but he'll strengthen us for it. Think about that. Why would he say we need strength and endurance and patience? <clears throat> if he was just going to give us an easy, easy, easy life, he wouldn't. If he was going to give us an easy life, he'd say he'd pray for us to have a lawn chair and sunscreen, right? What he has prepared for us, we're going to need strength and endurance and patience. We need to be strengthened for hard work, long work, challenging work. Work that seems like nothing's getting done. Work that irritates God's enemies. We're behind enemy lines here. That's where God has called us to live. So don't pout about it. Get strengthened. Get strengthened by his revealed word and get to work. And finally, the last few verses here, 12 through 14, we walk in a manner worthy of the Lord by giving thanks. Give thanks to God who has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. I love the way he phrased that. Not just when we think of it, not just once a day, not just once a week. But as we live each day, we need to live in thankfulness for what Christ has done for us. Right? The domain of darkness that we were rescued from. The spiritual darkness of a person that lives and doesn't know God. They can't see the reality of the world as God created it, as God rules it. It's a life that has no real truth. A life without real joy. The happiness is found only in temporary experiences and possessions. A life where contentment is just a dream and the goal keeps moving further and further. Faster and faster as you chase it. The life of fear where danger lurks because there's no light. A life without certainty of anything. A life without promise for the future. That's a life of spiritual darkness being separated from God. But it's not one that God desires people to live in. His revealed will says so. He has a great love for us and he brought the light into the world that is his son Christ Jesus. And in him was life. The life was the light of men. John talks about this in his gospel and in his first epistle a lot. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus Christ is God's light sent down to earth to pierce through the darkness. Jesus proclaimed to the people when he was preaching, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in this darkness because you have the light that leads to life. Right? People don't need to live in this darkness because God offers them the light. Anyone that is living in darkness that wants to come into the light just needs to come to God and humbly submit to his will and trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins. The sins of our life separate us from God. Past, present. He's perfectly holy. Can't be together with a sinful creature like us. But since he loves us, he made this way. And we just need to trust in Christ's perfect life, his atoning death, and his supernatural resurrection for us to bridge that gap. People can walk out of the darkness. And when they do, they see that darkness for the first time and they don't want to return to it. That's the gospel. It's what we have to live in thankfulness for, that the all-powerful God of the universe called me out of that. 
And he can use us to call others out as well. If you're walking in darkness without hope and without love, without meaning, you can have a new life and a new future in the light anytime by accept, accepting the atoning death of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. It will reconcile you with this holy, loving God. And here at Hope in Christ Church, we'd love to help you understand more about what God's calling you to do. So please let us know if you've made a decision like that. If God's calling you, please let us know. God can't wait to reveal it to you, this amazing life he has planned and his secret will. The amazing life of living in the light as a child of God. You know, I, I don't think that... I don't think that a boring life should be a thing for a Christian. I just don't see it. When you read the scripture and what God has planned for us, when you read the examples of people following Christ in scripture that he's given to us, I don't see many ho-hum moments. I really don't. I, I, I think that this should be the most exciting, dramatic, explosive experience that you can imagine. Because we have this path to walk. The righteous path that leads from the revealed will to the secret will. The creator and ruler of the universe has this place he wants for you. And he's showing you how to get there. And it's not just the place that you need to look forward to. The traveling, the path there is amazing as well. <clears throat> Huge adventure. Each one of us have this opportunity to encounter this by obeying what he's already revealed to us in scripture. Dig into it. It'll speak to you. He's shown us this secret. And it's not in a horoscope. It's not in a crystal ball. It's certainly not in some mystic with bad breath and two broken legs. It's a gift to you and I. It's what Jesus was driving at when he said, first seek the kingdom of God, revealed will. And then all things, secret will, will be added to you. Obedience to God and what he's revealed to you already will bring clarity to what he has planned for you. It's as simple as that. I want a full report next week on how this worked out for you guys. Because um, it's what I work on in my own life. And uh, it's pretty amazing. So uh, I'll give you one hint. It's not what you planned. So don't get yourself all worked up about... Uh, what you think his plans are. It really doesn't, it, it, that really doesn't matter too much compared to what his plans are for you. So um, I do, I would like to hear from you guys on this subject if you uh, want to dig into scripture and use obedience on one thing and see how it brings clarity on something totally different. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we have plotted a course here this morning. We're asking you to lead us to the place that you want us. And I'm speaking from your scripture here in the book of Colossians on a personal level. I'm speaking to each believer here, each believer that's walk, working on the, uh, watching on the internet. But we know also that this letter was written to a church and a group and we exist here as a church as well lord so not only is this a challenge to us lord individually but this is a challenge to our church please enlighten us lord show us where you want us as a body together as we search individually for your will let's pray that as a church also we'll strip away the things that you hate that are that oppose you convict us of this lord identify these things and show us how to be good neighbors. Show us how to be patient and loving with those around us, no matter who they are. I just pray that you'd work in us, Lord, and work through us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we're going to say uh, goodbye to our um, internet audience. And I'll introduce uh, Paul Taylor, who is going to lead us in corporate prayer.